It would be very hard to imagine life without electricity. Most of the appliances and machines that are used in homes, offices and factories are powered by electricity and this equipment helps to improve, helps to improve, helps improving, help improve, help improve people's overall quality of life. For that reason, the wider provision of electricity supplies is a critical factor in reducing global poverty levels, ranks, stages, degrees, levels. To meet the needs of users around the world, the global consumption of coal has risen more quickly since, since, in, at, for, 2000 than any other fuel. For countries that do not have their own supply of natural energy resources, coal has become an essential means, factor, means, cause, aspect, of producing power, on a global scale, Coal is currently used to fire power stations and produces 40% of global electricity. This figure, figure, sum, volume, total, is very likely to increase, and predictions are that by 2030 coal will fuel 44% of May world's electricity. Some of the most basic organisms are smarter than we thought. Rather than moving about randomly, amoebas and plankton employ sophisticated strategies to look for food and might travel in a way that optimizes their foraging. Biophysicists have long tried to explain how creatures of all sizes search for food. However, single-celled organisms such as bacteria seem to move in no particular direction in their search. To investigate, Liang Li and Edward Cox at Princeton University studied the movements of amoebas, dictyostelium, in a petri dish, recording the paths traveled by 12 amoebas, including every turn and movement straight ahead, for 8 to 10 hours per amoeba. Immediately after an amoeba turned right, it was twice as likely to turn left as right again, and vice versa, they told a meeting of the American Physical Society meeting in Denver, Colorado, last week. This suggests that the cells have a rudimentary memory, being able to remember the last direction they had just turned in, says Robert Austin, a biophysicist at Princeton who was not involved in the study. Managing performance is about getting people into action so that they achieve planned and agreed results. It focuses on what has to be done, how it should be done and what is to be achieved. But it is equally concerned with developing people, helping them to learn, and providing them with the support they need to do well, now and in the future. The framework for performance management is provided by the performance agreement, which is the outcome of performance planning. The agreement provides the basis for managing performance throughout the year and for guiding improvement and development activities. It is used as a reference point when reviewing performance and the achievement of improvement and development plans. The desire to build big is nothing new. Big buildings have been used to show off power and wealth. To honor leaders or religious beliefs, to stretch the limits of what's possible. And even as simple competition among owners, families, architects, and builders. Some of the most drastic, dramatic buildings of the past include the pyramids in Egypt, the skinny towers stretching towards the sky in Italian hill towns, and the Gothic cathedrals of France. While these types of buildings may look very different from each other, they all have one thing in common. They were built with masonry or stone walls supporting most of the weight, so-called load-bearing walls, including that of the floors, the people, and everything the rooms contained. Because of this, the height of these buildings was limited by how massive and heavy they had to be at the base.
The widespread use of artificial light in modem societies means that light pollution is an increasingly common feature of the environments humans inhabit. This type of pollution is exceptionally high in coastal regions of tropic and temperate zones, as these are areas of high rates of human population growth and settlement. Light pollution is a threat for many species that inhabit these locations, particularly those whose ecology or behavior depends, in some way, on natural cycles of light and dark. Artificial light is known to have detrimental effects on the ecology of sea turtles, particularly at the hatchling stage when they emerge from nests on natal beaches and head towards the sea. Under natural conditions, turtles hatch predominantly at night, although some early morning and late afternoon emergences occur and show an innate and well-directed orientation to the water, relying mostly on light cues that attract them toward the brighter horizon above the sea surface. Daniel Harris, a scholar of consumption and style, has observed that until photography finally supplanted illustration as the primary means of advertising clothing, in the 1950s, glamour adhered less in the face of the drawing, which was by necessity schematic and generalized, than in the sketch's attitude, posture, and gestures, especially in the strangely dainty positions of the hands. Glamour once resided so emphatically in the stance of the model that the faces in the illustrations cannot really be said to have expressions at all, but angles or tilts. The chin raised upwards in a haughty look. The eyes lowered in an attitude of introspection. The head cocked at an inquisitive or coquettish angle. Or the profile presented in sharp outline, emanating power the severity like an emperor's bust embossed on a Roman coin. Affordable early years education and childcare potentially enables parents, particularly mothers, to be in paid employment. International studies have found that countries with greater enrollment rates in publicly funded or provided childcare also have higher maternal employment rates, although entangling causal relationships is complex. From the point of view of the household, additional income, especially for the less well-off, is itself associated with better outcomes for children, as child poverty has been shown to be a key independent determinant of children's outcomes. From the point of view of the public purse, as mothers enter employment they are likely to claim fewer benefits and to generate extra revenues through income tax. Look at the recent Most Respected Companies survey by the Financial Times. Who are the most respected companies and business leaders at the current time? Rather predictably, they are Jack Wyke and General Electric, and Bill Gates, and Microsoft both have achieved their world-class status through playing nice. Wetch is still remembered for the brutal downsizing he led his business through and for the environmental pollution incidents and prosecutions. Microsoft has had one of the highest profile cases of bullying market dominance of recent times, and Gates has been able to achieve the financial status where he can choose to give lots of money away by being ruthless in business. The fall of smallpox began with the realization that survivors of the disease were immune for the rest of their lives. This led to the practice of variolation, a process of exposing a healthy person to infected material from a person with smallpox in the hopes of producing a mild disease that provided immunity from further infection. The first written account of variolation describes a Buddhist nun practicing around 1022 to 1063 AD by the 1700s. This method of variolation was common practice in China, India, and Turkey. In the late 1700s European physicians used this and other methods of variolation, but reported, devastating, results in some cases. Overall, 2% to 3% of people who were variolated died of smallpox, 
but this practice decreased the total number of smallpox fatalities by tenfold. Sociology is, in very basic terms, the study of human societies. In this respect, it is usually classed as one of the social sciences, along with subjects like psychology, and was established as a subject in the late 18th century, through the work of people like the French writer Auguste Comte. However, the subject has only really gained acceptance as an academic subject in the 20th century through the work of writers such as Emile Durkheim, Max Weber and Talcott Parsons, names that will be visited throughout this course. One name that you may have heard of, Karl Marx, the founder of modern communism, has probably done more to stimulate people's interest in the subject than anyone else, even though he lived and wrote, 1818-1884 in a period before sociology became fully established as an academic discipline. The study of objects constitutes a relatively new field of academic enquiry, commonly referred to as material culture studies. Students of material culture seek to understand societies, both past and present, through careful study and observation of the physical or material objects generated by those societies. The source material for study is exceptionally wide, including not just human-made artifacts but also natural objects and even preserved body parts, as you saw in the film, Encountering a body, some specialists in the field of material culture have made bold claims for its preeminence. In certain disciplines, it reigns supreme. It plays a critical role in archaeology, for example, especially in circumstances where written evidence is either patchy or non existent. Learning is a process by which behavior or knowledge changes as a result of experience. Learning from experience plays a major role in enabling us to do many things that we clearly were not born to do, from the simplest tasks, such as flipping a light switch, to the more complex, such as playing a musical instrument. To many people, the term, learning, signifies the activities that students do reading, listening, and taking tests in order to acquire new information. This process, which is known as cognitive learning, is just one type of learning, however. Another way that we learn is by associative learning, which is the focus of this module. You probably associate certain holidays with specific sights, sounds, and smells, or foods with specific flavors and textures. We are not the only species with this skill even the simplest animals such as the earthworm can learn by association. Snails are not traditionally known for quick thinking, but new research shows they can make complex decisions using just two brain cells in findings that could help engineers design more efficient robots. Scientists at the University of Sussex attached electrodes to the heads of freshwater snails as they searched for lettuce. They found that just one cell was used by the mollusk to tell if it was hungry or not, while another let it know when food was present. Food searching is an example of goal-directed behavior, during which an animal must integrate information about both its external environment and internal state while using as little energy as possible. Lead researcher Professor George Kemenes said, this will eventually help us design the brains of robots based on the principle of using the fewest possible components necessary to perform complex tasks.
From the earliest civilizations, plants and animals have been portrayed as a means of understanding and recording their potential uses, such as their economic and healing properties. From the first illustrated catalogue of medicinal plants, the Materia Medica by Dioscorides, in the first century, through to the late 14th century, the illustration of plants and animals changed very little. Woodcuts in instructional manuals and herbals were often repeatedly copied over the centuries, resulting in a loss of definition and accuracy so that they became little more than stylized decoration. With the growing popularity of copper plate engravings, the traditional use of woodcuts declined and the representation of plants and animals became more accurate. The supply of a thing, in the phrase, supply and demand, is the amount that will be offered for sale at each of a series of prices. The demand is the amount that will be bought at each of a series of prices. The principle that value depends on supply and demand means that in the case of nearly every commodity, more will be bought if the price is lowered, less will be bought if the price is raised. Therefore sellers, if they wish to induce buyers to take more of a commodity than they are already doing, must reduce its price. If they raise its price, they will sell less. If there is a general falling off if in demand, due, say, to trade depression, sellers will either have to reduce prices or put less on the market. They will not be able to sell the same amount at the same price, similarly with supply. At a certain price a certain amount will be offered for sale, at a higher price more will be offered, at a lower price less. If consumers want more, they must offer a higher price. If they want less, they will probably be able to force prices down. That is the first result of a change in demand or supply. Some children may need to learn to stand up for their own ideas especially when these do not conform to those of the rest of the group. But children also need to learn discretion, so that they can judge when it is appropriate to be divergent and original, and when it is appropriate to conform. The creative process is fun, it should not be taken too seriously. Creativity may seem like a fun, self-indulgent activity to counteract the more serious work of the classroom. But the creative process presents many challenges. It requires concentration, persistence and determination to succeed. It may in fact be a frustrating and difficult process. Creativity deserves to be taken seriously. Adults, therefore, can act as supporters and coaches, facilitators and models of creativity for children. But on the other hand, adults also have the potential to stifle opportunities for creativity by being overly didactic or prescriptive. They can limit creativity by discouraging fantasy or by having low expectations about what young children are able to achieve. 